Robert Buckland, thanks so much for coming on to Talk Beliefs all the way from Ann Arbor, Michigan. You are a 27-year-old patient care associate studying to be a critical care nurse, but are also heavily involved in bringing awareness to abuses within the Agape Boarding School for Boys, a private Christian school located in Missouri, a school that you were sent to for most of your teenage years. Well, welcome to the show, Robert. There's a, there's a lot to cover, so we will uh, jump right in. Uh, let's just start with your early life. Um, it all began in, uh, in Russia, isn't that right? So yes, it did. Uh, I just want to say, Mark, thank you for having me on. Uh, I was born in Kotlis, Russia. My parents flew out there. They didn't have uh, any uh, boys in their family. They had three girls at the time, uh, and they wanted a boy, so they went out there and adopted me. Mm -hmm. I don't know pretty much anything about my real family. Uh, I don't know if I really care to. I know at the orphanage, um, I would be stealing bread and I would get in trouble a lot according to what my family has told me. And But they fell in love when they adopted me and uh, brought me to the United States. Well, you came to live in the United States and of course your life changed dramatically when you were sent to Agape. But what was your family life like before being sent to a Christian boarding school. Did you have a religious upbringing at all? I had a great family uh, growing up. Uh, to answer your question about a religious upbringing, uh, I would say sometimes we went to church. Uh, I would say on the holidays, uh, but not really. I would say growing up, probably went to church about 10 times. I wouldn't say non-religious, but I would say my family had Christian values. Um, they had good values. All my sisters were great. Um, they were all very smart, um, very athletic, and I would always go to a lot of their soccer games supporting them. I w did Cub Scouts. Uh, my dad would take me to that when I was uh, younger, and then I stopped after about two years, I believe. Having a troubled boy is no reflection of parenting skills, as many other factors can cause a boy to turn against everything his parents taught him. Agape Boarding School was designed for families like yours. Our amazing 200-acre Agape campus in Missouri is truly a place where miracles happen. Well, at age 12, you were sent to the Agape Boarding School for Boys in Missouri. This was a school mentioned in my interview with Amanda Householder who fought against abuses within the Circle of Hope School for Girls. Robert, why did your parents decide to send you there? And why were your parents led to believe that this facility would help you? My mom was the one who was more led to believe uh, to send me there. I told her when I was, I think this all started when I was nine to 10, but I would say more 10, um, that I told my mom a couple times I hated her. Um, just like typical, most kids tell their parents they hate them. Yeah. I would throw my sister's lunchbox into the woods. Um, that's like the extent of the trouble I would get into. I called 911 or I pulled the fire alarm one time, which I was very young when I did that. And I was just, I guess, fooling around and didn't understand the consequences of my decisions. And I guess I really didn't believe my mom when she would threaten me and say, we're going to send you away. We're going to send you away. We're going to send you away. I didn't think that they really would. And I believe the message to them preached by Agape, uh, which ultimately, ultimately led me to being sent there was A, that it was a Christian school. They helped trouble kids. Um, they fix them around, turn them around and lead them to God. Um, but they were, they couldn't have been farther away from the truth. Well, you certainly didn't seem to do anything really that horrible though, did you? I don't think so, and I would say about most kids from Agape who knew me uh, didn't think I deserved to be there. Even a lot of staff at the end of like four or five years, I think, didn't think I deserved to be there, especially for six years for doing all that. And one of the saddest parts about that is a lot of adopted kids are sent to Agape. Um, Why adopt a kid if you're just going to send him away for his whole teenage life? You spent the next six years at this school and had very little contact with your family and the outside world. So what was a typical day like for you at this facility? What was the routine and what was expected of you? 
So every day we'd wake up, I believe it was at six in the morning. Uh, we'd make our beds, do a bed inspection, get ready for the day, uh, go upstairs uh, to the main dining room, read our bi Bibles every morning before breakfast for a half hour. Um, if you were if you were caught not reading your Bible, you would get in trouble. Um, after Bible reading, we would do um, our breakfast, then our morning chores, um, which consisted of cleaning the school. Uh, we each had our own different chores for the week, I believe, uh, and it switched every week, I think it was. And after the chores, we'd go to school or we'd do uh, work outside for the day uh, with maybe one or two water breaks for the whole day in 100 mm -hmm. degree weather, it, probably hotter, um, but I'll give them benefit of the doubt at 100 degrees. Um, kids would be dropping like flies during wor uh, work crews. I mean, we're little kids being forced to work and if you're not moving fast enough, they'd give you like a physical punishment. And so we would also, we weren't allowed to talk to other students at all unless staff members were present because they would think we were talking about planning a riot or running away. Uh, we had no outside connections to the world. We had no cell phones, no internet. We would watch TV maybe occasionally once or twice for the week. Uh, sometimes we'd get to watch sports games uh, a couple hours. Don't worry if your son is hostile towards spiritual things. We will not force your child spiritually. We love you and your son, and we are here to help. Agape, with the help of Almighty God, can and will change your son and make him a law-abiding, God-fearing young man. Uh, we were for forced to go to church every day. Sundays, we were forced to go three times a day. And you had to dress up for church service every day. And what if you didn't uh, show up or if you were late? No, oh, there was not you not showing up or you weren't late. You were on time. It was or you'd be in, in a room called the Padded Palace. <laughs> Gosh. And what what was the hierarchy there like? I mean, who was in charge and who was beneath them and beneath them? And how did it work? So James Clemenson and his wife named Ma'am. I don't know her first name. Uh, mm -hmm. They owned the school um, since the early 90s I believe it was and they were in California moved to Washington and then moved to Missouri and then under him was his son who was everyone knows he was he's very famous for abusing kids there uh, Brian Clemenson yeah there is definitely students above other students uh, there I think it went brown shirt orange shirt yellow shirt burgundy then it went to captain or not i'm sorry not captain i went to corporal sergeant sergeant major and then captain wow so there's a different definite sort of military vibe going on there oh yeah the, uh, we had military companies alpha company bravo company charlie company delta company echo company and each company had two platoons uh first platoon second platoon hmm and also, when I look at the the footage on their own promotional videos, it looks like that your all your heads are shaved. Or is that my imagination? Yes, we were either forced to part our hair um, with a comb and gel, or have our head shaved. Either or, there was no you couldn't like if you would parents would come, and they would take you out of town for a couple of days. You weren't allowed to get a haircut. You would get in trouble. Actually, a couple of students who got haircuts on their visit came back and they were actually in uh, some big trouble. Over those years, you saw a lot of physical, mental, and sexual abuses of boys by staff members and even other students. So can you tell us what went on there and what happened when students tried to speak out about it? Well, definitely. First things I would like to touch about is the, the suicidal attempts at the school. I would say in six years, almost anywhere from 50 to 100 kids, and might be more, tried killing themselves by drinking bottles of chemicals, drinking bottles of Germex. Um, there was a ki kids cutting themselves. Kid um, hung himself from, from the top bunk um, in the dorm. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, kids, I remember a kid, he flung himself down the stairs, two flights of stairs, trying to kill himself. Uh, I remember vividly all of this stuff happening. And when it happened, uh, under the law, you, you have to report it to the state and you have to get the kid help at a, uh, at an inst at a yeah. hospital, an actual institutional hospital, which was never done I, because I know that because I tried killing myself there multiple times, cutting myself, drinking bottles of a spray called yellow spray mm -hmm. um, for the physical abuse. I mean, that was every day. Uh, the staff members would restrain kids. I what really blows my mind the most is the George Floyd restraint was for nine minutes yeah. to a grown man for by I think three individuals. And there's a lot of outrage. And of course there should be, he died. But imagining this happening to 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 year old kids, mm -hmm. and not for nine minutes for hours and hours and hours at a time. And kids not being able to walk, move, all bloodied, broken bones, not getting professional help, uh, medical attention. Uh, they were taken to um, a local doctor in town there who never reported any of this to the state. Because if, if he would have, the, the school wouldn't be open today. I saw sexual abuse between students. It happened to me. Um, I reported it. Nothing happened. It, it kept happening. I The staff members there would encourage us to abuse some of the kids there. If any kid was gay, um, the staff members would tell us if they didn't want to do it, hey, go beat that kid up. They would look the other way. Huh. I, I remember that because it happened to my friend, and a staff member told me and a couple other kids to beat him up. I didn't want to do it, and... I didn't do it, but he he got beat up. His name was Cody, and you know he he's he's a great kid. He didn't deserve to be at that school. He was just an emotional. Um, he he's probably one of the best people I know today. Uh, it made him a very strong person. And what would happen if uh, the kids like uh, tried to get the word out, or what happened when the, their parents came to visit? If they did visit, what what would happen then? So there was no getting any word out. I tried writing my mom and dad letters probably hundreds of times in six years. The staff members there would read every letter you wrote before they sent it out because they were the ones in charge of sending all the mail out. So if you once if I wrote something bad in a letter, which I did, mm. they would tell you, hey, you can't write this. And if you would write it again or keep trying to do it, you'd get in trouble. You'd get in physical trouble. You'd get um, demoted or you'd get... On, put on the wall for a couple days or something until you tell them something that makes it look like the school's great school. And I know when my dad came and visited me at the school a couple of times, they put on a show. They're not going to abuse kids in front of the parents. I mean, <laughs> what what sense would that make? I mean, it would just show they're guilty and it, they, they did a great job and they've been doing it for 30 years just about I mean it's just mind-boggling that they, they've been able to put on such a great show they have connections uh, supposedly with a, a lot of people in Cedar County well I know when I interviewed uh, David Wernsman who was uh, he went was sent to Escuela Caribe the only way he was able to get out a letter was when a documentary crew came there and they sort of took pity Oh, when CPS, CPS came there a couple of times and they would only, I, I never got to meet with CPS, only the students who they would tell before, don't say anything, or they only okay. picked the students who wouldn't say anything as well. So you got the CPS coming to investigate claims and nothing's really being investigated. And I remember there was multiple students, uh, including Colton Schrag. He, um, he ran away from the school and he reported it to the sheriffs after they picked him up and found him mm -hmm. that, hey, look, there's abuse going on at the school. And there's plenty of kids with that same story. Hey, the sheriffs picked me up after I ran away. I told them of abuse and they didn't even listen. The like Cedar County sheriffs have failed us miserably, honestly. Like this is there. There's two sheriffs right now uh, who work for the Cedar County 
sheriff department who have ties to Agape boarding school. So how can you not be impartial when you have employees mm -hmm. of the school, also employees of the sheriff's department? Wow. So there was also a guy there named Kevin Depp. Uh, he was there for a very short time and he was in the dorm. Uh, I guess he had pooped in his bed and he was literally playing with this shit. This happened a couple times and he would be a uh, cop eating his own feces in, in an attempt to the school to send him away somewhere, which they did. And the school sent him away. We didn't know where he went. No one told us. We can't find him on social media. And there's a couple of kids like that who just got sent away. And that's the last we ever heard from them. So they did some, they acted out in a certain way so that they hopefully, they hoped that they would get sent away, but it didn't always work that way. I would say about 99% of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, it didn't, it didn't work. Right. I mean, when you get caught eating your own feces, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty desperate. I mean, I don't know what else you could do. They had a guy there, a staff member, who was actually convicted of molesting a kid at the school, yet no family was notified about this. The staff member was immediately terminated, but no family was ever notified about the situation, which is outrageous. You also experienced much of this maltreatment yourself. Uh, Robert, you were there for six years, so what were your experiences of abuse within Agape? My experiences of abuse at Agape were almost everything you can think of. I was, I remember when I was 13 or 14, uh, there was a guy in church, I, I'm not going to say his name, he was a, uh, he was a student and much older than me, uh, about, I think he was 17 or 18 at the time. He was on the basketball team and he, we were leaving church and he, I, I don't know how I ended up, I don't remember how I ended up being the last one out of the church with him. Um, I guess just the way it filed out in line, because we would walk out in line, uh, one straight line. He stuck his hand in my pants and was grabbing me. And I, I mean, I'm 13 years old. I, I don't know what to do. You know what I mean? It's, I reported it to the Dean of Students right away, uh, uh, Mr. Jackson. And he, they didn't, they investigated it, I guess. They, uh, th that's what they had told me. And they didn't do anything. They didn't separate me from him. They oh. didn't contact my family. They, which, if your son was making these accusations, wouldn't you want your, you wouldn't you want to be notified, even if it was false? Just the, well, the older boy was wasn't punished. No, he was not punished at all because, and it happened again. It ha he he came into my shower, and and tried, and I was naked, taking a shower in there. And he, 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 he came in there and I, and I, I luckily I got out like really quickly or, or he would have, he wanted, I, I, he wanted to do something. He was naked. He was getting naked and I was naked, taking a shower in the, in the shower stall. And I got out of there as quick as I could. I had I put in boxers and I ran out. I ran to the opposite side. We were, there's, I believe five or six bays in, in the shower yeah. bay. And I ran to my bay, which was in, I believe, Alpha Company. And I, anytime I would see him, again, come coming anywhere near me, I would go next to my friends. I would go to the opposite direction. I would try to be in a crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, thinking about it now, it, I just, I'm mind blown. My, boggle, it boggles my mind that. My family was never notified and for physical abuse and that happened to other kids that there too um it, some by staff some by students um there's a kid there named chris box who was abused by he was like 11 or 12 being abused by multiple kids there uh and mm -hmm. he he didn't really he was like i think a guatemalan kid with no family so who who is he who, who is he gonna tell you know what I mean? Everyone's taking advantage of him. And the physical abuse I know was terrible. I would be restrained for sometimes an hour or two. And 
they would tell you, hey, stop fighting, stop fighting. And meanwhile, all you're doing is crying in pain because uh, you got one person on one arm, one person on the other arm, someone with a knee on your neck and someone on your leg. So it doesn't feel good. And when it's happening for hours and hours and you, you, you can't really move after, it's terrible. I, I remember one time in specific, my dad had called me. It was a Sunday and I was in the room called the Padded Palace, which they restrained everyone in there. It's a, it's a big room. All the walls are padded. The floor is padded so they can throw you around in there and have, have a good time um, in, their, in their eyes, you know, treat you like an animal. And they would have, and you could hear kids from upstairs because this padded palace was downstairs. You could hear kids from upstairs screaming for help. I remember in church, there was a, a guy named Robert and uh, same name as me, uh, but almost every kid there when I was there remembers this vividly. He couldn't walk for days. He was, they had to take him to the hospital. It was that bad. And they, I don't know what they told the hospital, but obviously they didn't tell him that they had restrained him. Yeah. And so my dad, let me, I'll go back to that story I was telling. My dad had called me uh, while I was getting restrained on a Sunday mm -hmm. and I hear they all have walkie talkies of the staff members I, and I hear Mr. Buckland's on the phone for Robert. And I was, and I was glad I was thinking, Oh, I'm going to get out of this restraint. Like my, my dad's my saving grace. Surely they're not going to keep restraining me if my dad's calling. I, I, but they said on the, they said on the walkie talkie, tell Mr. Buckland, Robert is busy and he can't come to the phone at the moment. I wasn't busy. I was busy getting abused. Wow. I was in school one day getting my hair cut um, by Mr. Hajini, who is, uh, he was the barber for the school. He was a staff mm -hmm. member and he was cutting my hair. And I guess I, I, he just flipped out. I don't even remember what happened. Honestly, I, all I remember, he had the hair cutting, uh, the hair clippers cord around my neck, like literally strangling me. And there was staff and students. It happened in the school, like um, during the school day. Yeah. And staff and students had to get involved for him uh, to get him to stop. And it, it literally left like marks around my neck. Um, you could see a cord had been wrapped around it. And the um, school um, immediately oh. suspended him. I think it was either for one day or three days. And this wasn't the first time he's been suspended. And uh, my family was never notified that uh, one of the staff members there had abused me. Um, and that's just one instance right there out of the many times my family was never notified or any family was ever notified. Gosh, it's so horrifying. And also it, what comes to mind is that if it's a uh, quote unquote a religious school, it's almost as if they get a, a free pass, isn't it? Yeah. And it sucks. I think it boils down. Um, I, I really do. I believe it boils down to governor Mike Parson and, mm -hmm the local prosecutor and the attorney general, uh, Eric Smith and uh, Ty Gaither, the local prosecutor, all being Republicans, which shouldn't matter. But I believe I honestly mm -hmm. sincerely believe and a lot of people believe that they are more worried about losing the Christian vote and um, getting involved in something like this. And yeah. they're very hesitant because whether or not they're right or wrong, as soon as they get involved, they're going to lose Oh, probably I would say at least like 20% of the Christian vote for meddling with a Christian school, which a lot of people don't believe that should be the case. But the state needs to have some more oversight and have more control. And the governor claims he can't do anything, but he can. Where there's a will, there's a way. And if you really want to help someone, you can help someone. And if you want to do something, you can. But he chooses not to. He chooses to side with the abusers of Agape boarding school. Because a lot of these schools are unregulated, isn't that right? Oh, a lot. Um, every uh, school in the state of Missouri that was a religious school was unregulated until just the other day. And even still, they're unregulated because the law hasn't been written precisely yet. I believe that will happen next week, I think on the 12th of October, um, mm -hmm. which will give the state more control, but still not enough control. You know, it just, like I said, it, it just gives the state bare minimum um oversight over these schools compared to no oversight so i mean it's better than nothing and it's a start but still we have a lot of work to do
Well, eventually you left Agape at age 18. So what were those months and years like after finally returning home? So actually I didn't return home. I was at Agape for six years and my mom and dad were very, very gracious and they bought me a nice little condo down in South Florida, uh, which I moved to. Uh, at mm -hmm. the time when I moved there, I didn't know anyone in Florida. My family wasn't even in Florida. They, they were planning on retiring there, I think the following year. But I literally moved down there, didn't know anything about life, being sheltered at Agape with no internet, no t phone, no TV, no anything, not being taught about life. So I'm just automatically thrust into the world at 18, have, have my own condo. I think life's great, you know. I mm. make some wrong decisions in my life. I actually decided to move out of a condo my parents bought me to move in with two strippers. Um, just thinking the situation was a great situation, which looking back at it, in a way it's good, it's understandable, and in a way it's not. It depends what your view is. Uh, it's understandable in the sense I didn't know anything about life, um, but that is a pretty like big decision. But I back that up by saying that I wasn't taught anything about life, and I just didn't really know. And I wanted to have fun, you know, being at Agape sheltered. And yeah. did you tell your parents about what went on? Um, no, I didn't tell them actually really anything. We didn't talk about Agape that much. We just talked about going to college. Um, me trying to um, establish myself in life and get a foothold. My, my family tried to help me out a little bit, um, but they never really even brought up Agape. Um, mm -hmm. They didn't ask too much about my concerns from what I remember. So, yeah, it wasn't really discussed at all, actually, if, if at all. Maybe they, they, thought, they looked at you and thought, um, it's worked. Yeah, maybe. For sure. Robert, the troubled teen industry is far more widespread than most people realize. There are facilities like Agape in many parts of the states and other parts of the world. So what can people do to help shut down these places? Well, the troubled teen industry, as you said, it's not very talked about in this country at all. Um, if you actually do research on Google, you'll find that about one troubled teen school if that's what you want to call it, or a school that abuses kids is shut down about once a week to once every two weeks in the United States. And yet Agape boarding school where the attorney general recommended, I think 70 charges just about against 22 staff members, that mm -hmm. place remains open. So what I've been doing, and I've only been doing this for about a month and a half since I've started remember, remembering things slowly. I know, Amanda Householder, Colton Schrag, James Griffey have been great in what they've been doing. Uh, we just helped get a law passed in the state of Missouri for the first time since 1982 mm. in, against religious schools. Uh, just basic things in the law, like common sense. Uh, Agape never required background checks of staff members that work there. In the new law, that's a requirement. Agape, would if a parent showed up at the school wanting to see their kid unannounced, Agape would send them away and say, you cannot see your kid. Now, a parent, if they come to the school and demand to see their son, they can see him. The school can't send them away. And now they have to make the state aware of all their health and safety um, protocols, which before was not a requirement with the state. I would say Missouri is actually the worst state in the country when it comes to protecting kids. Um, I, I've i been calling uh, the FBI. I've called the governor's office. I've spoken to Department of so Social Services, uh, the director, Jennifer Tidbull. I spoke to the general counsel for our, the Department of Social Services, Maria Hahn. I've spoken mm -hmm. to lawmakers. I've spoken to Jared Taylor, chairman of the House Oversight Committee. I've spoken to Carrie Engel, state representative. So I think it comes down if you're at a school that abuses kids and you leave there after trying to report it, be mm -hmm. persistent. Call your local representatives. Call the authorities. 
call the FBI, call the U.S. District Attorney, call Department of Social Services, Child Protective Services, tell your family, tell all your friends, post about it on social media. I mean, there's there's always a way. I mean, I, I, Agape in Circle of Hope just recently have spread like wildfire um, with their stories coming out all over the news because people are calling, people are being persistent. And Amanda persistent. used TikTok, didn't she? Then, then all yeah. sorts of people, including Paris Hilton, got yeah, 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 even Paris Hilton. Uh, she, I think she's involved now in uh, the Provo School up in Utah. Um, and I think they've actually got, they started a petition uh, with that school. I think it's got an almost 300,000 signatures already. Yeah, um, she, went, she went to one, didn't she? Yeah, she went to one. She um, she was abused. And I think her coming out and saying that really bring, carries mm -hmm. a lot of weight as well. Because I know people, people have mixed reviews. I've spoken to students of Agape who want to watch from afar. They don't want to get involved. I've spoken to kids from Agape who want no involvement in this whatsoever. And it... Your voice always matters, regardless of whether you think so or not. Hmm. Just keep talking and be persistent. That's that's literally all I can say because that's what I've done, and I've got it in lots of answers. Just in the last month, I call these offices literally every morning. I work the night shift at the hospital. I call all these offices in the morning, and then I go to bed. So I don't go to bed till about noon every day um, after getting home at about 7.30 in the morning every day. So I, I'm making calls left and right, calling these offices two times, three times, four times a day. And now some of these places know my name. You know, it's, uh, they kind of get frustrated, but you know, it's- That's the way to do it. Yeah, that's the, that's the way, persistency is key. So how does Agape's and the recent Circle of Hope investigations impact the troubled teen industry? I think what's going on uh, with Circle of Hope in Agape is a damn shame, honestly. It's it's an embarrassment. Uh, the state of Missouri has failed us. Uh, Governor Mike Parson, Department of Social Services, Jennifer Tidbull, um, the House and the Senate, some of them have failed us. The Highway Patrol has failed us. Cedar County Sheriff's Department has failed us. How can you get charged with over 100 felonies? I think 16 girls were, um, there's 16 recommended charges for rape out of the over 100 charges and yet Judge Mudden from Stockton, Missouri, only the Attorney General requested that they be held in jail. Mm -hmm. The local judge allowed them to be out on a $10,000 bond, $1,000 cash. I can get a traffic ticket in the state of Missouri and have a higher bond than that. So you're saying these girls and boys' lives don't matter is what you're really saying, and it's a shame. I'll tell you, a lot of kids from all over the world are watching this, not just the U.S., all over the world. And what they're seeing going on in the state of Missouri, it's not even a slap on the wrist to the Circle of Hope owners or to the owners of Agape. It's a slap in the face to the victims. And I think Amanda said that too, and it's just hmm. it's so true. I mean... It is not even the local prosecutor for Agape's case was recommended 66 charges uh, precisely by 22 staff members. Not one of the 66 charges was acknowledged. Not one. The local prosecutor filed, I think, 14 charges, and they were the lowest type of charges that you can charge. Uh, I think 10 Class E felonies and four misdemeanors. So you're telling me abusing the kids a misdemeanor? How is a school even allowed to operate that knowingly everyone can say, yes, they abuse kids? Even the lawmakers, the police, the the FBI, the governor, they can say, yeah, well, look, look, the attorney general recommended all this, and yet it's okay. The school can remain open. Please allow, keep abu abusing kids. You know, eventually someone's going to die and the blood's going to be on their hands. And when that happens, I, I hate to say it, how many kids do you think are going to come forth when they do another investigation? None. No one listened this time. 198 kids came forward from the last three years at Agape Boarding School. 
Not one kid was listened to. Well, you're doing a lot of work towards this, and uh, you've also set up a petition, haven't you? So tell us about that. Yeah, so I signed, um, I set up a petition um, this morning, actually. Um, I'm trying to get some help with it. I just posted it um, online this morning on Change, shutting down Agape Boys Ranch. It's, uh, it needs to be shut down. Uh, it needs to, get, to give closure to all the victims, to give and see real justice. You know, what, what's going on right now is not justice, and it doesn't bring anyone closure. If anyone, it brings the abusers closure by knowing that their school is going to be allowed open and they can continue to do this because nothing's happening. And we'll have a hyperlink for that in the description below the video. So please, everyone, if you're watching this, please sign this petition. Well, I've done several interviews about these behavioral modification camps, as they are sometimes called, and it never gets any easier to hear these accounts of abuse and neglect. And I definitely want to applaud you, Robert, for working so hard to right these wrongs. I will leave links to your social media as well as activist sites in the description below. And all that's left to say is thank you once again, Robert, for telling your story on Talk Beliefs. Yeah, Mark, I want to say thank you for having me on. I'm very uh, privileged to be on here, and it, it, it means a lot, and people are listening. And I want to say to Agape victims, survivors, or anybody from Agape, or anyone from Circle of Hope, keep coming forward. Keep talking. It's not over. It's just begun. Agape can run all they want from this, but they won't be able to hide from all the pressure that we're putting on on them. I think it's we've come a long way. We still got a lot of work to do, but we're going to get there eventually. And just don't give up. I get discouraged myself sometimes. I got discouraged yesterday. Give my my buddy a call, and you know everyone gets discouraged. It's it's discouraging seeing nothing happen, but be persistent because that that's the only way stuff will happen. Like Mark had said, I had started a petition this morning. I encourage everyone, agape, non-agape, kids from all over the world to sign it. Have your voices heard, you know, share your testimonies in the comment section on the petition page. I'd be happy to read those. And I'm going to give Mark my email address as well. So anyone who has a story of abuse or anything that would like to come forward from agape or any other school, I'm more than happy to listen. And I'm always here to talk to you. And I know there's a lot of people all over the troubled teen industry wanting to encourage you and not to give up hope. Hope is a very powerful thing. Please don't give up.